fall upon. So I did. I fell in the hands of a gentleman who um, helped facilitate my uh, entry into prison. Um, and then once I was released, of course, I did not know what to do because I had no skills. Um, and I've spent the last 20 years trying to gain skills, trying to change the language of what a convicted felon is. Um, people seem to think that when you hear convicted felon, you're automatically a murderer or this or these terrible things. And actually, um, convicted felons are uh, teachers, preachers, um, mathematicians, scientists. They are lots of things. Now I work with uh, women who have been released from prison um, and are trying to find their way. Essentially, they are faced with the same hurdles that I was faced with over 20 years ago. There are realistically no options. Go ahead. My name is Earl Rogers. Um, I'm nine years in prison. Um, 20 to 21, just got out last year. My struggles with re-entry would be like um, the technology gap, just, just um, like how, how advanced technology is, how fast everything is. And I was, I was behind, I was behind on technology, so just trying to catch up to that. Coming home, like, you know, no permit, no license, like all that's done expired. Have to start all the way from, from the beginning. Back home with your parents, from being independent, you know what I mean? Being totally dependent, um, hard to find work. Um, to to now, I work full time on the leave. Um, got a great job, I drive frames, and I'm a motivational speaker. Like I speak with elementary schools, I speak with universities. Um, so it's kind of just it's kind of just about giving back. And, um, like I'm, I don't know, like I'm focused, like. The vision just kind of came all the way back around. Like, like prison was hard, it was, it was stressful, it was bad. And then just being able to come home and share my story and, and give back, man, it was a very fruitful experience. I'm Ron Brown. Um, I was incarcerated when I was 19. I got out, I served 25 years. I got out about six and a half weeks ago. I think my, my view of reentry has been something that's it's kind of off the beaten path. Um, for me, it began with understanding that I didn't end up in prison on the day that I actually went to prison. I ended up in prison sometime before that. So my mindset, my thinking, and so what I've done over the course of my time being a member of Shakespeare Behind Bars from, for 17 years, I had to rethink about how, how I viewed myself and how I allowed other people to help me to think about myself. I didn't, I didn't have a, a way of looking at myself that was derived from myself. Yeah. Everything that I saw about myself was something that somebody told me about me. And Ironically, I was, I was 19 when I went in, and I thought I was a man at that particular time. It was probably some seven years, seven to eight years after I was incarcerated that I, I really started to understand what that really, what that really meant. Um, getting out was overwhelming to me in the sense of not that I was uh, overwhelmed by the actual physical aspect of prison, and not being in it anymore. I was overwhelmed by the fact that the world that I left was so much different. I have, uh, I have nephews and a niece now that, that look at me and they need me to be a part of their life. They need me to help them develop. And I'm 44. Now, and I'm still developing, so that scares me sometimes. 
And so for me, it's a process. But it's a process that the difference between me now and when I was 19 was it was insurmountable when I was 19. Now I look at it and it's a challenge. And I may not know today how to overcome that challenge. I know there's a way to do it. <clears throat> now I'm willing to ask for help in order to uh, meet that and to overcome that because I understand that I don't have to do it by myself. And I've been blessed with a lot of people, including some of the people that are here, up here and in the crowd, that helped me along their way, step by step. Thanks, Ron. Matt Wallace, uh, I've been director of Shakespeare Behind Bars at Luther Luckett Correctional Complex. This is my ninth uh, season doing that. Uh, about 10 years ago, we started Department of the uh, juvenile Justice Program at Ottawa Youth Development Center. Um, we also started uh, about three or four years ago uh, the Journeyman, which is for 18 to 21 year olds. So we have multiple programs, the Incarcerated plus Shakespeare Beyond Bars, which are programs for uh, uh, students uh, to tr try to keep them from going to prison, or they might be in facilities that might potentially uh, they might be at risk of coming to prison. Um, it's been an honor to work with these guys uh, inside and now our favorite moments when we see them outside. Uh, over 21 years, Shakespeare Behind Bars has had uh, around 70 guys complete a year in the program and get out. National recidivism average is 67%. Kentucky average is about 29.5%. And that's counting for three years. We count for 21 years and have a 5%. So we. Four of our guys have committed new crimes and come back, and this is uh, the best thing to do is to get to see these guys in this setting, to get the texts. We have some other alums in the audience, Bill, Chris, uh, it's a Shakespeare Behind Bars reunion. <laughs> That's why we keep doing what we do. Um, 
I wasn't able to help her with her homework. So I felt like I had once again failed her. Um, and that started my process to truly look within myself and find ways to build myself into them. Um, and education did that for me. Thank you. Uh, I would say Holly's exactly right. Like it, it's definitely a process. I don't believe that it's like an overnight thing that like a light bulb just clicks and you just change like um like, like with me going into twenty one, like I had to I had to grow I had to grow up. Like my mindset had to change. Um, I was locked up my daughter's whole life. My daughter is, is, is ten years old. And um her mother was pregnant with her when I when I caught my case. So our whole life was between County jail glass and then prison yard visits. So like just just me missing like her first steps, her first words, first day of school, so, and I have to take all these memories by by photos, like getting them through the mail or phone calls, hearing about what's going on, like it, it became like enough where like something's gotta change to obituaries coming into the mail and I can't go to funerals. My family's like my life, like I, I come from a very big family. change my comfort zone. I had to come outside my box, which was Shakespeare. And um, and, and Ron, he's like my big brother in prison. <laughs> and I tried to get him to sponsor me for Shakespeare. He told me no. <laughs> <laughs> but but he, knew, he knew that I wasn't ready. I was, mm. still, I was still growing in my process of, 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 of prison life. So um, like everything just had to kind of come together. And it wasn't like an overnight thing. And once I got in Shakespeare, and um, my first role was a police officer, which is definitely outside my country. <laughs> <laughs> imagine, imagine being like a, a thug in prison and then wearing a, a badge and some, some handcuffs. And it was a contemporary production, so it's actually had a bit. <laughs> you your dues on that. I, I, can you just say, what about when we started this 18 to 21 year old program? Had never done it. And a lot of the folks in, in the Department of Corrections said, you're never going to get 18 to 21 year olds to do a Shakespeare program. <laughs> well, we got a couple guys, you know, that I, you hadn't done much mentoring at that point. I, I was early. And, and I tell you what, to see him come alive as a mentor in that program was right. incredible. And that's pretty much what started me working with kids, and it went from the journey then to doing like a scared straight with like people bringing like troubled kids into prison and talking to them, mentoring them, to to what I'm doing today. So that kind of started started that ship. So it was definitely like everything had to kind of come together, you know, for me to to you know change and be who I am today. I, I kind of agree with everybody else. It's, it is a process, but I, but the first eight years I was in prison, I never acknowledged my responsibility for why I was in prison. Then I was I was talking to my daughter on the phone, and my daughter was born after I was incarcerated, and uh, she said. She wanted to be a lawyer. She was eight years old at the time. She wanted to be a lawyer when she grew up. And I'm like, why do you want to be a lawyer? She said, I want to stop the state from taking little girl's daddies away. Mm -hmm. So I was like, it was at that moment that I realized that my daughter was growing up with the mindset that her father had just been taken off the street and he didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And I was like, at that particular time, I didn't even... I wasn't even considering whether I was ever going to get out. What I did consider was, I can't, I haven't given my daughter anything, but I could give my daughter the truth. Hmm. And I hadn't done that yet, and I didn't want her to grow up with this mindset of looking at the world as like, oh man, uh, daddy was just taken off the streets because he was black, and and, and you know, you can't trust white people, and... <laughs> And I didn't want her to, to be limited in her life like that. 
And at that particular time, it was like, something's got to change. And I was in Shakespeare at the particular time. It started in 95. And at this point, I had been in for a few years. But the few years I had been in, I had a misconception about what acting was. I thought that acting was about telling a good lie. <laughs> <laughs> at, at, at the time, I, I thought I was good at lying, which is ridiculous now looking back on it because, you know, I ain't never been in trouble before. First time I get in trouble, I get a life sentence, 25 years of the uh, role, you know what I'm saying? They, inter they interrogated me. I gave myself up after two hours. <laughs> <laughs> And so, obviously, I ain't going <laughs> So, I was like, Kurt, who was the uh, uh, original uh, producing director and founder, he was trying to tell me, tell, tell the truth, tell the truth. And I didn't understand what that meant. I didn't have any concept of what that meant for me. But I knew I had to figure it out. So... For me, it was a matter of I had to find something outside of myself that meant something to me because I, at that particular time in my life, found no value inside myself. So I had to kind of take uh, the backdoor approach. And my daughter was a part of me that I loved. I couldn't love myself as I, as I was. So I had to find a part of myself to love in order to find my way back to myself. So I think, you know, just to summarize, what I'm hearing you say is that value of yourself and the fact that there are things like programs like Shakespeare's Behind Bards that really kind of help you maybe start to see the world in a different way that helps you touch some of these values that you, you haven't really thought about before. And I know that with the kid program out at Audubon, I had done some work um, actually helping um, the facilitators of the Shakespeare program connect it to things that were criminogenic. So the reason I'm saying this is because there are a lot of programs that people think are helpful for folks, you know, like um, you saw them in the thing, you know, you get ta you taught, you know, how to be a beautician, but you get out and you can't, you can't do one because, you know, the laws are such. But there are programs and there are treatments and there are ways of addressing what actually predicts reoffense. And um, even though we know that, sometimes folks get exposed to things that don't actually have any relevance at all least or once they're on the street. So there's millions of dollars out there, Second Chance Act grants, all kinds of money, and there's all kinds of programs. <laughs> but if you go and you actually look at these programs, some of them are designed to truly help you be successful, and some of them are just because it sounds good. And, um, and, I, and I guess Attica Scott will probably pick up on that next okay. week. So with that said, I want to throw it out to the audience invite some questions to the panel. Well, my first question is, use the word criminogenic. I'm, I'm yes, unfamiliar sorry. with that term. If you can define it for us. Yeah, criminogenic, and you'll have to forgive me because I, uh, I'm a clinician, but I'm also a professor. And um, I moved down here actually because I was tired of seeing psychology uh, people who, had, uh, who didn't really understand what was required to help someone get that hope and motivation. So I decided to create a graduate program. And so I'm at Spalding University. And so I use that word a lot. <laughs> and so um, thank you for asking. And all that it, all, the, the definition is very simple. It means that it's related to crime. So there are non-criminogenic things that have no relationship to crime. But you'll find a lot of programs that target those non-criminogenic things. And, and the factors that the panel have spoken about, values, that there's different, some people take a little bit of time to get going in their process. Accountability, honesty, those are criminogenic. Uh, whereas there's some other things that, that are less so. Can I, just, I want to point out something about programs that, <clears throat> something I learned in the past nine years, and what I love about Shakespeare by Bars, 
you have to have a year clear conduct to get in. But it, we, it's not an official program because I want to share some of how to, how to program. And this is really interesting, and I learned this. If you come into prison, let's say you're 19, you know, how how does the pr you know like um <laughs> like the programs in prison like now they have like like you can't really get no programs unless you're two years or less to send the pro board. So if you have 20 year sentence, you're basically like in pond water, like the majority of you've been. And Until then, right before you get out. And then two years or less, you can get into these programs. So now you're trying to rush all these programs in before you see the pro board. Like, what are you actually learning? Like, and, and that's, it's a shame, for real. It's a shame how it's set up. I mean, like, plenty of people write, you know, grievances and try to talk to the program warden about, like, the way it's set up. But they feel like the people who are going home first have... Like the what's, what's the they have like the priority. the priority for um for programs and then you have people you know like like us doing time so now like we're we're doing nothing trying to stay out of trouble but like Shakespeare a year of clear conduct it's something every year like a nine month process to perform I mean the um, the prep for a play and it's probably the only thing like it that that I've been in then even when you get in programs like. Once you get to your two-year mark, like you can only get in so many before you see the pro board. So I feel like it even makes it sh more stressful when you see the pro board. Like, did I get enough programs? Did I, did I do enough work? And well, the Shakespeare behind bars is well, the reason we didn't make an official program. So we don't want people doing it to get good time. You can't get any good time for doing it. But I, I just thought that I, I wanted to share that because that's something that I learned that I had no idea that it kind of boggles the mind to think that. You know, and it, so it wasn't always like it. You know, we had that. That's what the 18 to 21 year old program. You don't even have to have good contact. We take you right off the yard, and, and that's. You know. well, the pro, well, not just the pro, programs haven't always been like it. And being there for 25 years, I watched it from when I first came in. Now you can get in all kinds of programs when I first came in. In 1994 happened. You had the uh, Bill Clinton's crime deal happen, and. Prior to that, we was able to go to college and Pell Grants and things of that nature. They immediately stopped it. And they started rewarding states for um, giving more time and shutting down a lot of these programs. And so that, that ended up going into 1998, Kentucky, you know, saying violent offense laws, where 85% came into play. And so you, having watched it go from this end over here where you had some programs, and keep in mind that I personally believe, having watched them, having talked to people in program, I don't care what kind of program you have, you can have whatever program, you can have doctors come in from all across the globe. If the person doesn't want to change, it won't do no good. So, but at the same time, you got a lot of people that are wanting to turn their life around. But, you spend, they spend more time worrying about Priya and, 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 and they have officers that are now working 12-hour shifts that are frustrated about the fact they haven't had a raise in X amount of years and everything. They're working longer hours. Now you, they're agitated. Now you got staff agitated, inmates agitated, uh, parole board with an unclear criteria of what it is. And so now everybody is in the state of just being angry, and you don't have any programs, and then what happens is, is now everybody is just, it's a, it's a crapshoot what happens when I get out. And you, get, you, got, you got individuals where they're saying they're not, they're not even providing enough for people to get GEDs. If you're letting people out of prison with a, without a GED, you are basically setting them up for failure. Exactly. Because there's no way for you to live a life it's hard with the GED, right, right. but it's impossible without a GED. What do you? And so you, you're basically saying, "Hey, we're gonna believe in you to go out here and get your GED," but you're not giving them the opportunity to do that. And I'm not one that kind of make make myself a victim or anybody else that's incarcerated victims because we we do what we do to get there. But at the same time, uh, we have a lot of people that think that. Prison is just about some basketball, some some working out, some cable or whatever. And 
as evidenced by looking at this play this evening, our perspectives are different sometimes. And anybody that has been in prison or has family members that are in prison, they get this they get this rude awakening that they didn't expect. I at one time when I was looking at TV and see somebody on there uh, talking about conditions and what the programs were, I would just turn the channel and holler about, man, you shouldn't have did what you did. <coughs> and then I found myself on the inside looking out, and I realized at that point in time that I didn't know what I was talking about. So it's just watching, watching those changes for me and spending over half my life in there. It's like it changes that, that perspective, but it also changes my perspective now because I probably see the world now at 44 a lot different than the average 44-year-old now. I'm hopeful about it. I'm not even. I'm not beaten down by the world. I'm not. I'm, not, you know, I'm like. I'm like excited I, when I walk in Walmart. I'm just like Kings Island. <laughs> I love everybody. I love everybody. <laughs> This man, this man. Wow. He had a job within a week Good. after That's 25 years. Wow. So, wow. Right now, so you've got opportunities and you're, you have a job. This man. I actually worked two jobs for, for about a month. And then uh, uh, since I moved, because I'm staying with my mother to help take care of her and be, uh, be around my nephews and everything. Um, which is cool, good for me because it put me in a position of being around familiarity. Somebody that I knew that I had to be anything but me. Uh -huh. And so that made it easier for me. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of like, I enjoy my job. Like I'm doing things that I ain't, I ain't never done before. You know what I'm saying? That, uh, basically I work for a sign company where we build custom signs, you know? And every time I'm driving down the street and I see like mattress and more, I'm like, hey, oh yeah. Yeah, I did something look just like that. So <laughs> I, I did that. <laughs> It's, it's fun to me. I, I find myself taking pictures with the phone because I'm creating something, you know, and that means a lot to me. You know, ultimately, I would like to do some of what he's doing, the motivational speaking and things of that nature, but right now, I'm appreciating each day. I'm excited when I get up in the morning to go to work. I probably, I make more in one hour than I made in a week <laughs> where I was at. You know, I made $2 a day where I was at, so, you know. When I get my check now, I'm just happy. <laughs> <laughs>